All right. So I'm back on track. <coughs> Psalms 84. <laughs> All right. Psalms 84. Uh, the title is Blessed is the Man Who Trusts in You. Psalms 84. How lovely are your dwelling places, O Yahweh of hosts. My soul has longed and even fainted for the courts of Yahweh. My heart and my flesh sing for the joy to the living God. Even the bird has found a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she sets her young. At your altars, O Yahweh of hosts, my King and my God, how blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. How blessed is the man whose strength is in you and whose heart are at the highways to Zion. Passing through the valley of Baca, they make it a spring. The early rain also wraps it up with blessings. They go from strength to strength. Each one of them appears before God in Zion. O Yahweh, God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. See our shield, O God, and look upon the face of your anointed. For better is a day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would choose to stand at the threshold of the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For Yahweh God is a sun and shield. Yahweh gives grace and glory. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk blamelessly. O Yahweh of hosts, how blessed is the man who trusts in you. Right. Good deal. Let me, let me check my, this, my recording device yeah. before I get too wound up here. All right. So uh, our next one is the catechism for tonight. Uh, the children are on question 34 this week. Uh, their question is, is, who can change a sinner's heart? And their answer is simple as that the Holy Spirit alone can change the heart of man of the sinner. And there's scripture there. Uh, John 3 said, Jesus answered and said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And then I'll, I think their scripture of emphasis tonight is Titus 3, 5, but we'll read 3, 5, and 6. He saved us not by works, which we did in righteousness, but according to his mercy, through the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And then if we were doing it tonight, uh, what is effectual calling is our question. And you see the answer there. Effectual calling is the work of God's spirit, whereby convincing us of sin and misery, enlightening our minds and knowledge of Christ and renewing our wills. He doth persuade and enable us to embrace Jesus Christ freely freely offered to us in the gospel. So that's kind of our deal. So anyway, that's our catechism of the night. Uh, again, for those that have children, that'll you'll know where they're at uh, in this process. And, and um, So give me a second, because I, I, I have misplaced something. Yeah. Of course I have... Thought I misplaced my notes. I was like, ooh, ooh, ooh. I was going to be panicking there. All right. So as we begin tonight, we're, again, I, I promise you we will close out chapter five tonight. And we will close out this, this section of our study uh, on justification uh, as, as we finish up tonight and everything. But uh, uh, what I'd like to do is start out reading the, the whole uh, 12 through 21 again. But we'll concentrate on 18 through 21, which will close us out tonight. And uh, so, and as we've talked about in the last few weeks, 18 ties you back to 12. Uh, Paul sidebarred on 13 to 14, and then 15 through 17, he kind of gave further explanation and, and strengthened his resolve on what he was saying in verse 12. And then now we'll see here in 18, 19, He'll close out that whole thought ideal here in this section. And then in 2021, which is pretty neat, Paul kind of bookends back to 321 is where we started this uh, study uh, on justification. So he kind of bookends back to that, that whole idea. So he kind of closes it all together in there. So that's what we'll look at tonight as we talk through this as well. 
All righty. Verse 12 says, therefore, just as through one man, sin entered into the world and death through sin. And so death spread to all men because all sinned. For, for until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned. In the likeness of the trespasses of Adam, who is a type of him who has to come. But the gracious gift is not like the transgression. For it, if by the transgression of the one, the many died, much more did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to the many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned for the, on the one hand. The judgment arose from one transgression resulting in con- condemnation. But on the other hand, the gracious gift arose from many transgressions resulting in justification. For if by the transgression of the one death re- reigned through the one much more those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of the righteousness will reign in life through the one, through the one Jesus Christ and our scripture for tonight. So then as through one transgression, there we, and y'all have to pardon me because I'm, my eyes are playing. uh, I don't know what they're doing right now, but I'm not reading very well. Resulted condemnation to all men, even through one act of righteousness, there resulted, Justification of life to all men. For as through the one man's disobedience, the many were appointed sinners. Even so, though, the obedience of the one, the many will be appointed righteousness. Righteous. Now the law came in so that the transgression would increase. But where sin increases, grace abounds all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so, grace would reign through the righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. All right, so uh, as we look at this, so again, as we said last week, we, we kind of closed out with 15 through 17, 13, 14, 15, 17, got kind of explained it, but as we said before, 18 goes back and picks up and joins in with 12. And so we see that. In fact, Paul even goes as far as what? It looks like he repeats or re and re- Reinstates, restates, restates what he said in 12 in a more succinct way. But he says that so then as through one transgression, there resulted condemnation to all men. Even so, through one act of righteousness, there resulted justification of life to all men. So basically, as we see Paul uh, right here to the Romans, he, he's he's given reconnecting and then he's further explaining uh the, what he was trying to get after, I guess, is what I'm trying to get at there. He uh, he he basically sums up the argument that we see here. He sums it up, and and so then uh, he just reclarifies, I guess, is there. And and again, I apologize because right now my eyes are all kinds of all crazy, and I'm not really seeing anything on the papers, so. Give me a, a second to see if I can clear my eyes. And, cause I, huh? I don't know. It could have been. I'm not real sure what's going on right now. <laughs> uh, I, I have bouts of fuzziness, but this one is like doesn't want to go away. All right. So, all right. I can see a little bit now. All right. Uh, so anyway, so as we look at this, what as Paul talks about it, and as we talked about in 12, what is the, the gist here? Adam. In Adam, what, what entered the world? Sin. sin. In, through Adam, sin entered into the world. Through one act of disobedience. And again, it was a true act of disobedience. It wasn't just like he, he stoned a cup. God in, in Genesis 2.17 clearly had articulated to him what he was not supposed to do. And so we see Adam here. And, and through that act of rebellion, through that act of defiance, because in the in as we looked at it, and we kind of talked about it last week because I talked about it in terms of me, and that is is that you know sometimes uh, we try to give people bias <laughs> when they openly 
willfully disobey God's word. Now again, having slipping into it and there, but when you openly do it and, and, and for Adam, it was a, it was a strong willed disobedience. Satan convinced him that God was not being nice to him. God wasn't playing fair with him. God was holding out on him. And because of that, he needed to do this because God really didn't mean what he said. And so in Adam's mind, he got caught up into that deal. And, and we as, as Christians, and, and we tend to do that as well. Sometimes we get caught up into that, that fallacy that Satan paints in our life, in our mind that says, oh, you know, God's, ah, God, he, he didn't really, he, you know, he just, he was kidding with you, or, or he, he, that's not what he intended, or he, tra- he just gives a, a trigger out. And so we see that with Adam, and again, he openly defies God's rule. It wasn't like he was, it was just a passive uh, failure. He truly did. So in that act, in that act of disobedience, Adam, through Adam, sinned it. And we talked about it last week, that in that thing, and with the Jews, corporate ideology is, is that what? Is that in Adam, even though we were not there, we were a part of that corporate loss or that corporate deal. So in that, we, uh, we sin there. And out of that resulted what? Come to nation to all men. Even so, through one act of righteousness, they resulted, there resulted justification of life to all men. So we see Paul doing what here? He says, in Adam, we sin. In Adam, we get condemnation. In Jesus, we get what? Justification. We get in that act of righteousness result in justification of life to all men. So we see in that comparison again, and we've seen it over and over. It's not like this is the first Paul comparison. We talked about it last week. He, he, in three verses, he made three comparisons of the difference between Jesus and Adam. Jesus was perfect. Jesus was a man who lived a life perfectly and was able to meet all the requirements of his father. And in that act of obedience, he, he gave us a means in which to be justified, to be saved. In Adam, he was disobedient. And in, in that light, we are there. So as we talked about it before, in Adam, all have sinned. So the word all means what? There. Everyone. Is there anybody that escaped sin? And how do we know that? We talked about it last week. Death. Because of sin, death, the physical death came in, in light of that. So it, as, and then in that sin of death, we know that because why? Paul talked about it. He says, from Adam to Moses, people died. So there was sin. Even though there was no law, because law didn't come to, to play to Moses, right? To the mount where God gave him the Ten Commandments and then all, out of that. So, so as we see there, Paul is basically summing up in those succinct verse there in verse 18. He's summing up what he's been saying for at least since verse 12. <laughs> and truthfully, through the whole thing. But, but for sure, uh, what he's summing up for what he said in verses 1 through 12. And he, saw, he talks about uh, the ideal there... Uh, Again, and let me go, I want to, now that I can see paper clearly, or clearer, let's talk about all men. When we talk about all men, because we're going to talk about all, we got, Paul uses the word what? All and, what's the other word he uses? Many. He kind of talks to that, that logic. All meaning for us, all. But can many mean all? Maybe, but probably not. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, but all can there. So, and the reason I'm kind of dwelling on that is because as we look at what Jesus done for us, a lot of people we talk again. A lot of this is I'm repeating from last week because Paul wrote so much in those verses. The idea is that we have people who believe that word all in, when it comes to Jesus. That all means everybody. And do we know we believe that everybody's going to be saved? No. The scripture is clear that everyone is not going to be saved. 
So all or many has doesn't mean the same for Jesus's what he did as as what the result of Adam's sin. Jesus's salvation or Jesus' death obedience does have a idea of all because we know there's going to meet me many. What is it? Revelation. I'm going blank. Uh, five. Is it chapter five that talks about the vastness of? Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Is it five? Uh, it is relational. Uh-huh. Yeah, most that know yeah. Number. right. There you go. So we know there's not, it's not going to be just a few. It's going to be many. It's just not going to be all. That's what I'm trying to get at. So I, I want us to clearly understand that because from a doctrinal perspective, we need to clearly know, understand that and, and, and put it into our, our, our thought process and that. All have sin, so that means everyone. Why is we know that everybody sin? Because everybody dies. In Jesus, many will be saved, but not all, because that's there. And we we'll talk about it a little more thoroughly here in verse nineteen. But anyway, I just wanted to kind of go back and 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 uh, pinpoint that down just a little bit uh, in that in the fact that. Uh, uh, a lot of people take that word and yeah, and, that, and they do. They're not they're not being fair to the context mm-mm. of the letter, right? Because if you go back to Romans one, yep, it's like I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, right? right. So clearly, the all there is referring to those who believe, right? You know, um, right. yes, not all is like a universalist. Yes, that that would be the case. If we, if your doctrine leads you to believe that Jesus, there will come a time that everybody will be saved and nobody's going to hell, then it, it, we're, we're looking at a more universalist thought process than that there. Because it, it is clear that God has saves those there, but he doesn't save all. That's what I'm trying to get to. And there's kind of like, I don't, I don't know, Stylist, just writing stylistic things going on, you know. You got the all, you got all, you got the many, the many. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it doesn't. You can't make a whole theology no, out of that style. No, no, you know, no. And 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 at least from my understanding, from what I read and studied, is okay. that a whole idea of that stylistic thought was is for Paul to really confirm, lock in the idea that it's not everybody for salvation, right. and it's but it is everybody for. Sin, mm-hmm. and that was the whole reason. Paralleling that together yeah, was yeah. so that yeah, so that people could understand and they would clear that. Because again, he was talking to a predominant Jewish audience. So again, for them, the law was for them. Adam was, you know, what I'm saying for it. Just he was he was happy to get after that whole idea. Uh, of that is that uh, to overcome that that whole idea because for the Jew pers- Jewish nation or Jewish uh, people the idea that long as they did the law <laughs> they were good to go but then Paul was having to remind them you know before Moses there wasn't no law <laughs> but there were people dying so we know that God had punished them there <laughs> and then and even in the law People were dying, and, and you know, so so that uh, there, and and then, and then we'll see that here, uh, here in just a second here. Uh, I think that's it on eighteen that I was I had kind of jotted down. Yep. yep, yep, yep. Okay, so as we looked at the first one, we we kind of can categorize that as a summation of his argument, and then in verse nineteen we see Paul. Uh, kind of give him an explanation of that summary. He says, for as through the one man's disobedience, the many were appointed sinners. Even so, through the obedience of the one, the many will be appointed righteousness. So again, Paul talks about what, in verse 18, talks about uh, Adam in, in the terms of transgression, condemnation. Now, what does he say in verse 19 about uh, Adam? How does he describe Adam? 
Say again. Disobedient. <laughs> exactly right. He, Adam was disobe- disobedient. So the reverse of disobedience is? And who was obedient? Jesus. Jesus was so obedient, and we're, we're going to talk about it in terms of active obedience and passive obedience. But, but again, the idea here, though, is that in disobedience, man, was, we were appointed as sinners. In obedience, uh, the many will be appointed righteous. And again, we say many, but it's not all, but it is many. And, and like I said, if we read Revelation and we read there, many is not just a few 12, it ain't 12 or 144. It's going to be a many. It won't be the total world population as it, from Adam to now, but it will be many. But again, it's through Christ that that, that happens. And that's what Paul's getting after. Too. And, and as we look at it there, we, we talk about disobedience. Again, I go back to kind of what I was trying to say about Adam, and that is, in the, when we disobey something, when we disobey the traffic laws, what, do, what is our? We get a ticket. But why, why do we decide to disobey them sometimes? We're in a hurry. But is it by accident? I would say 9.5 t- times out of 10, it ain't an accident. You made a what? A conscious decision to disobey. And that's what I, that's the whole idea here. Paul said that Adam made a conscious decision a, to disobey what God had told him not to do. It was just it was just a fruit. And you would think in a garden full of trees <laughs> in a garden full of stuff <laughs> And the best stuff, because no sin had been entered at that time, so everything they ate, other than that fruit that, of that tree, was good. It wasn't bad. You think that that would not be a temptation for Adam, but it was. And, and even though Eve was the instigator, we talked about that. Why? Why did Adam get the blame? Uh, he was the head. Also, why? Yeah, yeah, he was the head, and God told him. <laughs> it wasn't like he had, it wasn't like it was a secret, and God and Eve snuck up on him and made him happen, and Adam had no clue. God clearly told him there. I wonder what would happen if Adam had said, Eve, what have you done? I told you not to do that. that, that that's a good question, Brother Doug. <laughs> uh, that's a good question. If we're thinking outside the box, what would have happened if Adam had not, if Adam had at, at, had halted, said, hey, nope, I'm not doing that. We're wrong. We messed up. God, and start talking. You know, because what created... Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I want. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's the understanding I have, or that's my takeaway of the scripture. Yeah. I don't know, even if he would have said that, he probably still would have been at fault because yeah. Spirit the snake through the head. There you go. Yeah, right? yeah. Yep. Crush the serpent. Right. Well, well but he, he should. He should have crushed the serpent. Yes. He didn't, but, but that's why Jesus, the new Adam, crushes the serpent. Right. Uh, so, the, good point. And, and to your point, he should have approached Satan at that point the same way Jesus appointed Satan as he came out of the desert at his 40 day. He should have said to him, that's not what my father says. This is not the right. Now, God, Jesus had scriptures that he quoted and, and that's things, but... Instead, but, that was the first known cover-up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, 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 yeah, and it, it's crazy because instantly they did what? They covered themselves. They, and they lost their mind because they tried to hide from God who they'd been walking with for ever how long and knew full well that he knew exactly where they were at. You know, and, and again, I go back to us. Sometimes do we not do the same thing? Do we have this in our mind that, oh, I'll do this and God didn't see that? <laughs> I, I mean, when you, you know what I'm saying? We act like God didn't see it. <laughs> How it? Yep. I, I, yeah. Yeah. 
so, so anyway, so in disobedience, Adam, the many, in this case, the many is all, <laughs> means all, were appointed sinners. Even so, though, the obedience of the one, who's the one? Jesus. The many will be appointed righteousness. And so as we look at obedience of Christ, let's talk about it in terms of a couple of things, active and passive. In the active obedience of Christ, what do we see? We see Christ being born into this world as a man, into this sinful world. And he is actively obedient to, he's born into the law, under the law. And he's actively obedient not to break any portion of that for the next 33 years. He comes and he does exactly what he has to do to be obedient to his father, to be come out on the Calvary as the unblemished lamb that will be need, that will be there to be slain. So Christ actively obeyed his father's will, law, purpose, and all that. He actually did that from get from start to finish. And how do we know that? Because that's the only way we could be saved. Because if he didn't do it completely, freely, and without sin, he didn't disobey anything. He obeyed it all. He was perfect in every which way. As a man, <laughs> that's the only way he can get to Calvary. Also, and be, he had to be born of the Holy Spirit. Yep. That, exactly, 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 exactly. But what the but the the active will be, and where I want to go with that is, is that if we have Christ in us, then our spirit should want to be a, have an active attitude for obedient, being obedient to God. That's what I'm trying to get after. We should have that same attitude. Will we have the same results? No. But our attitude daily should be actively being obedient to God. What does James say about obedience? If you love God, you obey God. If we love the Father, we will obey the Father. We will actively pursue obedience in our lives, in our nation. Does that mean we're going to be perfect? No. Does that mean we're going to make mission every day? No. But we have to be, that should be a part of our life. That should, because once that Holy Spirit gets into us, we have that ability to no longer sin. Yeah. Period. Yeah. Well, we don't want to disappoint well, no, that's true. I mean, I'm, I'm just saying, like, yeah. as a, yeah. a child or a parent, you don't want to purposely disobey them. You know, you want to try your best yeah. and you want to, you know, every day. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Who? <laughs> Who? There you go, brother. Yeah. So, so either, yeah. So in that, that we see Christ through that his act of obedience to his Father. That's how he he was able to complete the mission that God had put him on, the destiny that God had put him on through that act of obedience. But there's also a flip side of that. There's a passive, and we see that where. In Jesus' life as we do it. Passive obedience. Calvary. Garden of Gethsemane. And as he entered Jerusalem, what did he say about Jerusalem? He wept over it because of why? Through that, in his passive obedience, he there, you know. And so, in that light, we see that in that passive is there. Because what did it require for our sin to be taken care of by by Christ? The shedding of, but not did he shed? Didn't he shed his blood when he was circumcised? Did he shed his blood when he sweated it out at Gethsemane? When he did that, when the crown was placed on his thing. So in that example of, of obedience, 
even in those little things happening to him along the way, though not an active obedience to the law and to the to the mission, but it, a passive obedience to Christ because he had the, as we saw him in Gethsemane, what did he ask the Father? Huh? Well, he asked the Father, his, he, he asked that his will would be done. Was it about, the, was it about Calvary? Mm-mm. That if there was any other way. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. It, was that about Calvary? No, it was about what he was about to experience with his Father. It was about that separation, the, the, the punishment that comes with sin. We, we won't know till we get to heaven what that meant. Law, law. law, yep. The passive obedience would be the past. Is obeying, obeying, but it's being. No, no. no. I, 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 how do we? How do we define? Yes. Oh yes. yes. So, yeah. He's being. He's being obedient, faithful on the cross, even though they're the ones right. acting upon him. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, the idea, yes, the idea is that he's being obedient even in the midst of what's going on around him. That's the passing it. He goes to Gethsemane on his knees and prays three times to his father. Again, father, if there's anything <laughs> that I don't have to, if I don't have to do this to be separated, you do. If I don't have to have your wrath, because again, we won't know today, but I, Marty said a few weeks ago, that wrath is, the wrath he threw on his son for the sin that started with Adam and ends with the last person. That's a lot of wrath because we read about that. We've studied it. God's wrath right now is just at bay because of what? His mercy on us, his mercy on the world, his mercy on the thing, his promises uh, of for things. So so that whole idea of wrath. And then I think, was it last week somebody made mention of it, which is what I believe. And I, at the point of that happening, God turned his back on his son. I believe that's what happened because he can't look upon sin. So if he can't look upon sin, then the only option God had was to put all the sin on, the, on him, put all his wrath on him, and then turn his back on him. And, and so, in that light, yeah, Randy, that's that's it. The, the thought there is that in there, and uh, and because of that, the many is that all? So we said the many is all for the sin for Adam. The many for Christ is those that are saved, those that are appointed, called to be saved. Yep, it's that right. resulted. Yes, exactly. Right, so faith yep. in Jesus required there. It's leading stock for all men. Not all men take it. That's correct. Yes. That's the difference. Yes. And my interpretation says resulted. So the same idea. That in his open there, it resulted in those who. Uh, it, it leads there. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Of life of all to all men. So they have, they have there. And, and, and to your point, not all men do because not all men are called it, called out of their death, I guess. So what translation is that, Steve? This is ESV. Mm-hmm. ESV? Yeah, mine is L. Uh, it's interesting. The, but the result would be the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Result, result of, yeah, yeah. The result of Christ is that. We, we have justification. It, the result of that righteousness. So it's interesting in the original Greek, it's a preposition like to. Yeah. Just like to all. So I don't, that's interesting how they, yeah, like, like to or um, like to all. Men. Yeah, and that's what mine said. Yeah. Mine says, yeah, mine says resulted, their resulted justification of life to all men. That's what mine says. Oh, I think 
active ricinus, there resulted desiccation and all. So while Randy's looking, just some, yeah. no, some, yeah, yeah, some, under the thought, press, uh, thought of passive obedience to Christ, uh, 1 Peter 2.24 says he bore our sins in his body on the tree. Uh, the, the also refers to he carried our sins far away as our scapegoat. And then John 1.29 said he is the lamb who takes away the sin of the world. So in that, yeah, fair, yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, yes, taking that on to us and everything, so. Cool. I was trying to see if I thought I had another scripture. Yeah, but I don't. thought I written, did another scripture there. Okay. All right, so that takes us to verse 20 and 21. Any, any thoughts? All right, so in this last section, uh, it kind of concludes the section. And again, it's not a, it, it is the conclusion, conclusion of 12 through 21, that whole thought I tell. But it's also, again, I told you that in those two verses kind of bookends. If you go back to 321, so, so we've been in justification since chap, uh, Romans 321 to now. So some two and a half chapters of verses by Paul strictly about justification. And in 321, he says, doo, doo, doo. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, and even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction. And so we go back over to 520 and 21. It says, Now the law came in so that the transgression would increase. But where sin increases, grace abound all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace should reign through righteousness, through eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So we see Paul kind of booking in his thing here with that same idea of sin, being the enemy, being the start, being the finish, and then Christ being the answer. And we talked about that over the last month or so. Christ is the only answer. Christ is, if without Christ, there is no justification. Without Christ, there is no way to heaven. Without Christ, there's not a way for the Father to forgive you. There's no way. It's only Christ. Only Christ. And we talked about it a lot last week. If Christ is in us, then what? who does the Father see? Or what does the Father see? He sees Christ. He doesn't see us. <laughs> That's the good thing. Because if he saw us, the battle would be on. <laughs> but because we, Christ is in us, Christ is a part of us, Christ has balanced the scales in us because of our acceptance of that calling, that acceptance of that salvation from him, God sees his son. And without there. And, and Paul is closing that out. He says, then the law came in so that the transgression would be increased. So what does Paul say in there? Why would the, why would sin increase when the law came? Because people became aware of it. Exactly. That's the whole idea. Prior to Moses' law, they sinned, but they didn't transgress because there was nothing to transgress against. But they did sin. But when law came now, they know, and the more they learned and the more they got told, then the more sin became what? Evident. So now they were going from not knowing anything, because if you read the Old Testament, especially when you start talking about the punishment stuff, you see real quickly what? That the biggest punishment become in the law was when you didn't know something. If you knew something, then it was harsh. <laughs> you got sacrifices for not knowing. Like I could go offer a, this sacrifice, that sacrifice, or that sacrifice. But if I murdered someone, there was no sacrifice for murder. <laughs> what was the answer for murder? Death. 
There was no sacrifice for adultery. The answer for adultery was death. So God only gave sacrifice capability to this Jewish people for those things that were not distinctly in his law, in his guidance. If he, t- he gave them a law and a punishment, just like Adam, what did he tell Adam? If you eat of it, what happens? You die. So when he, when he wrote the law, he said the same thing. If you do this, you die. If you do this, you lose a hand. If you lose it, do this, you lose your, your eye. If you do this, you lose this. He gave direct things. So my point is, is the reason sin abounds is because law brings it to revelation. And so now it's there. So what is, what is Jesus' answer to that? What is it? Paul say that the answer to that is? Grace. There you go. Grace now becomes more. Why? Because God's mercy becomes more. As his people sin, and his mercy and his grace gave them outs. His mercy and grace gave us what? An out. Through his son, Jesus Christ. But that's the idea here is that the law brings forth the what is happening. And the more you know the law, the more the sin is evident. And because of that, the more the more sin is evident. Then Paul says in that grace abounds all the more. I think of it like Jesus comes to a door that he's going to enter. The door says for perfect people only. Yeah. And then he looks at all, all of us and says, they're with me. Cool. 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 And then in verse 21, Paul, uh, again, goes on to say, yep, yeah, I'm good. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to an eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to, what did Paul say? Righteousness to eternal life. So the opposite of death is? The only way to get the opposite of death is? Jesus. That's the whole idea here. Paul simply saying that there's, we, have, we have two federal heads. If you're in the in the natural, if you're in sin, then your your federal head is Adam. You got your kingdom is what sin. Your head is Adam. If you're in Christ, your kingdom is the Father, heaven, eternal life, and our head, our federal head is Jesus Christ. So we have two kingdoms, two heads, one. We either we belong to one or the other. There's not there's not a third party or fourth party. We might wish it in our government, but in Christ there's only two. You get the only one or the other. You might want some other options in, in our government, but you don't get them in Christ. You get either Christ or you get Adam. You don't get the, you don't get any more options there. And then what I like and we uh, he finishes up and uh, I'm doing okay. Jesus Christ, our Lord, and I, and I, I have a couple of things I wrote down or got down here. I wanted to talk to that. And, and Paul does this a lot. Uh, he uses that combination, Jesus Christ, our Lord. But I just want to, I think we talked about it in a couple of lessons over time uh, since we started Romans, but I wanted one more time to do it. Jesus. What is Jesus? He's the son of God. Jesus in this case is what? The saving name. It means Jehovah saves. Jesus is God in human flesh and who came to save sinners. And Matthew one twenty one says, You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So Jesus, Christ, we talked about it on Sunday in our class. Christ is a title. Uh, I picked up on this. It's also, it, it's, it means anointed one. Because it's through Christ who's come to the power of the Holy Spirit with the anointing of the Holy Spirit. He is the one who has come. So it's Christ, the title. So we got Jesus' name, who's the one who saves. Christ is title, the anointed one. 
And then we see the name Lord or Curios, and we talked about that, I know, several times, meaning the sovereign one, the spot, ruler, king. That is his sovereign name. So we see three parts of Christ. We see his humanity, and that's Jesus. We see his title, and that's the anointed one in Christ. And we see his position, and that is Curios, Lord, Savior. Yep. Yes, sir. And then, and then I got uh, Acts four twelve says there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Cool. I just want to throw the ice cool. I want to throw the Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, so in Psalm two, cool. where it's the kings of the earth take their stand, the rulers take counsel together against. Yahweh and against his anointed. So in the Greek version of the of the Old Testament, uh, it's called the, the Septuagint. Um, the Greek word there is is Christu. Christus, Christus. Christ. right. So it literally it's like against Yahweh and against his Christ. Right. Isn't that pretty cool. Who? Who? Right, Who? I just want to throw that out there. Who? And I just want to close this this session out with a couple of takeaways, whatever you want to call them. One, as we studied over these weeks, we we've un, we clearly have art, Paul has clearly articulated the power of sin and what it can do. It can cause death. It can damage us. It can do that. So, so as we as we move forward, we need to keep that always in our mind that sin causes death. That power, it's a powerful thing. Satan has not got any less cunning. He still has a lie after lie after lie. He even goes as far as to make what we think is the truth look like his lie look like that truth that we think. But it's a powerful thing. And then the other uh, second thing I, was, we, I want to remember is that, we, and you just said it, so I don't have to say it again. We want to do it again. But the effect of sin for those who are not in Christ is death. I mean, even us who are in Christ, we still pay from being a part of Adam, and that is we die physically. We, we die on this earth because of what Adam did in there. Third thing I want to think is important obedience, and, and I really, I, I, that struck home with me as I read that and, and kind of copied out that whole idea of active obedience. That should be our mantra. That should be our life. That should be our hope every day when we woke up is that we can actively be obedient to God. Because we talked about it, the law, at least, at least the moral law, still applies. And the law of Christ on our heart still applies. To be obedient to that, to actively daily wake up for that idea that we walk in Christ. That we walk obedient to our Father. It should be a part of our daily life. Not saying we're not going to slip. Not going to say we're not going to go left or right. But I'm saying that should be our goal. We should wake up wanting to do that. We should wake up making that determination. And then lastly. Is that we. In what Paul wrote over these last two and a half chapters. We can see clearly. That the grace of God is merciful. And Loving and mighty. Because without that grace, we would have a bad destination. Cool. On that, we close out this section. We'll be looking forward to chapter 6, verse 1 next week. And I might get past 1 next week, but I don't know yet. Cool. Thank you all very much.